Hello, I'm Earl Taylor, Chief Marketing Officer at the Marketing Science Institute. As many of you know, nonprofit MSI serves as the bridge between marketing theory and business practice, and our goal is to move the needle on significant marketing problems. We do this by funding research by leading academics worldwide on topics voted by our corporate sponsors and disseminating those results and research through members-only events and a variety of publications. I'm very pleased to welcome you to another MSI for members by members webinar. This is a series of webinars on subjects related to MSI's current research priority topics. Now first I'd like to point out the chat with presenter function in the left hand corner of your screen. Please use this feature to send through any questions you have for Peter during the presentation. We'll gather those questions and have a brief Q&A session following the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. Peter Levin is strategic planner of the data center group at Intel Corporation, and his talk today is Beyond an Internet of One-Off Solutions. And I should add that Peter's uh, talk that he gave for us last September at a workshop we did on the Internet of Things hosted at George Washington University uh, was rated one of the highest of any presentation uh, in the course of 2016, so we're very pleased to have him back as a repeat of that presentation in our Best of MSI series. Peter is an organizational and economic sociologist with 10 years of experience studying markets, organizations, and technology at research universities and management schools, and he is currently a research scientist and a strategist at Intel in the data center group. So with that, we'll turn things over to Peter. Great. Thank you for having me, and welcome. Um, three years ago, uh, I left my job as a sociology professor at Barnard College in New York, where I had worked for almost a decade. And I moved across the country from New York to Portland, Oregon, and took a position as a senior research scientist at Intel Labs, which is a research and incubation organization within Intel. Um, I am almost certainly the only sociology PhD in a company of 100,000 people. Uh, I went there to work with a handful of other social scientists, technologists, and designers to learn about and to shape the future of technology, that is, to do foundational product innovation. And we did this um, work by going out and researching people in the world and building prototypes and then designing systems that we thought would intercept people's changing lives. Um, three years later, or three and a half years later, I guess, I work now as a strategic planner in the Intel's um, data center group. My work today is focused more at the intersection of social science technology and strategy, not design. And I help in identify competitive threats, transformational ecosystem changes, and basic business model innovation. At, a, at its heart, what I do at Intel is I provide context frameworks and tools to determine how ecosystems are changing and what those changes mean for the company. As part of this work, I've conducted research on precision agriculture, helped design a system for distributed next generation transactions, partnered with external companies to build and test all kinds of prototyped technologies. Um, basically, my job at Intel is to, um, to look over the horizon of five to seven years and to, um, and to help us understand uh, what the implications of those uh, transformations are for, uh, for our company. I'm sharing with you today a view developed with my colleagues of the future of IoT. Uh, my framing of this is really going to be around poetry and plumbing. And the poetry and plumbing metaphor borrows from the organizational sociologist Jim March. Uh, his argument is that leadership is a combination of poetry and plumbing. The poetry renders meaning into action, really, that it's those interesting interpretations of reality that form the basis for constructive collective action. And on the other hand, no organization works if the toilets don't work. Um, and so poetry provides vision, and plumbing makes that vision work reliably and routinely. Um, and that's what it's really all about. In the tech and marketing world, most people appreciate the poetry, the vision of the future that captures the imagination and brings the impossible into focus. So self-driving cars, smart homes, actuating technology, reaching across the human digital divide, enabled and personalized through data. And all of that is real-ish. Um, but unsurprisingly, most people are at best indifferent to the plumbing. That is, the nitty-gritty user research, technological development, coding, integration, and ecosystem work 
um, that makes maybe the future possible. Absent the plumbing, we get the non-functional and the trivial. We get a world of crappy robots and self-ordering refrigerators. So first then is going to be some poetry around the consumer Internet of Things. That is the vision of what's possible when we migrate from computers on desks in offices and homes towards computers and compute in the external environment. And then some plumbing, the work of shaping the data collection and analytics that it would take to make that poetry really sing. So this is um, a photograph of a bee that some enterprising engineer at Intel decided that um, they would stick a bunch of sensors on. Um, in particular, they decided that they would um, start to um, track what bees did and how they um, actually flew around instead of just understanding bees and what we know about them from um, biological study over a long period of time. And it turns out that um, when you put a microchip on a bee, um, you find out things about bees that you get when you measure what they do as opposed to what you uh, model it, what you think you, they do. Uh, so one of the things that Intel scientists have found out is that uh, we thought bees are monogamous. Um, that is that bees uh, really only uh, centered around a single hive. And it turns out that actually measuring what bees do reveals that some bees are um, promiscuous. Um, that some bees, not a lot, but some bees travel from hive to hive. Um, and I tell you this partly because it's a fascinating world of um, what you can possibly measure um, in this world of IoT. And I tell you that possibly because I've always wanted to use the expression promiscuous bees in a talk. So, um, so, so, here's, so here's some of the poetry really. It's that we live in a, in a signal moment, um, a time of great technological transformation. And yet the shape and the process and the dispositions of this transformation are still, I would say, fuzzy at best. Our artificial intelligence, unprecedented compute power, and social networks now effortlessly um, connect billions of people and organizations around the world. But we also face unprecedented concentrations of power and wealth, dramatic changes in meaningful work, global environmental climate change. We are, as my colleague Tony Salvador would say, um, in a state of capital F flux. For example, we've all likely experienced the transformative effects of mobile platforms. On demand, um, now for those who can remember checking, and I'll age myself a tiny bit, printing out customized maps before making a trip like an animal, um, on demand maps are now something entirely new. Waze, Snapchat, Uber, Pokemon Go, Fitbit, Amazon Echo, the list goes on and on. These apps, services, wearables, and devices don't really even live natively on your computer anymore. Um, I live in Portland, Oregon, where you need a phone to use the bike share system. Whole economies are now built on mobile platforms that simply did not exist just 10 years ago. However, at the same time, embedded systems that is, machines operating in tight coordination in factories, navigation and flight systems operating in tight coordination in jets, um, which are really the precursors to IoT or Internet of Things, are at this point you know, half a century old. Compute in the environment is both old and new. And we need ways to distinguish between the magic and the modernity of this moment. It's not things that connected to computers that's new. What's new is things connected to computers, to networks of other things, and to our natural environment. And of course, these things are connected to us. We're just starting to understand the transformations happening around IoT, and I'm going to share two of them. The first insight is that IoT worlds are what we would call model-to-measure worlds. Cheap sensors, analytics, and platform tools change our expectations and challenge our assumptions around long-held knowledge and practices based on what I would call models. Models are meant only you know, ever so slightly metaphorically here. Uh, they, are, they include true models, actuarial tables used by insurance to value your car insurance semi-annually based on the make and model of your car, your age, your reported driving history. They also include estimates based on historical averages and folk knowledge. So yeah, bees are monogamous. Uh, I'm from Illinois originally, and um, in Illinois we used to say that the corn should be hot knee high by the 4th of July, that you should exercise 30 minutes three times a week, that you milk the cows twice a day. I could spill this out and spin this out even wider. 
Uh, Yelp reviews are a proxy for judging restaurant service. You know, 400 milligrams of ibuprofen based on the average weight of a typical U.S. adult. All right, these are all model worlds. They're based on educated guesses, general rules, historical norms, and process-based outcomes. What changes with IoT is, it turns out, uh, nearly everything. From model, where your car insurance is based on your demographics, calculated every six months, to measure, where pricing is based on individual behavioral data based on the last 300 miles you drove calculated daily. A measure world is one where farmers feeding corn to cows based on the number of calories that the cows ate in the pasture 30 minutes ago. Right? A measure world includes restaurant services measured as time to table via sensors embedded in a serving tray, the greenness of Intel supply chain documented with verifiable measures, and individual pre individualized precision medicine based on your personal DNA, and daily well-being measures measured in near real time. Right? And the picture here is um, a cow that I actually did as, um, took a picture of as part of our research um, in this case, it happened to be in the southern tip of Australia, down in Tasmania, where farmers were putting um, these Fitbits basically on cows and measuring, you know, how much uh, how much grass they would they would uh, they would eat in the fields. And so you could actually measure um, at the individual cow level uh, how much grass uh, an individual cow ate and where it ate that grass. It turns out that uh, based on the the telemetry and the pressure and the geography and the GPS of what a cow's Fitbit collar says, cows do something like 11 things, which I know is really exciting if you're a cow person, but otherwise you probably would have ballparked that cows do about 11 things. Um, and so what's cool about it is that if you, if you match up this uh, Fitbit collar with a cow's um, with an automated or a um, RFID reader in the barn, you can actually see individual cows how much you know how much um, kilo, how many kilojoules of energy a cow needs in order to produce milk. You know exactly how much grass a cow ate out in the field, and so the cow comes into the barn, an RFID tag in the cow's ear is read by a computer, and that cow gets in a bucket exactly the amount of grain that that cow needs in order to meet the kilojoule energy requirements for producing milk. Right? So instead of giving every cow the same amount of grain, you give each cow exactly the grain that they need. So that's what I mean when I say a measure world. So of course many of these visions remain just that, you know, visions. But you know, in some ways this world is already technologically possible. Um, as William Gibson, you'll find that people in technology like to quote William Gibson a lot, um, has pointed out, the future is, is really already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And what we see is that insurance seems to be getting there first. Uh, over the past two years, uh, maybe two and a half now, Progressive Insurance has begun and increased a program they call Snapshot. It's part of a wider move towards UBI or usage-based insurance. And so they stick this little telematics device in your car, and they capture real-time data. In this case, they only capture three things, miles, hard brake events, that's when you, you know, step on the brakes really hard, and what time of day you drive, in order to price insurance not based on who you are, but based on what you do. From auto insurance, this model to measure frame is migrating to home insurance, health insurance, towards more esoteric forms of risk management. It's very much in the process of disrupting actuarial professionals who for a long time have been experts in what I would call post-event financial effects analysis, but who know almost nothing about real-time pre-event condition and hazard level monitoring. I'm going to pause for a second because somebody asked in the chat if we lost audio. And I want to find out if it was just for him or if it was for everybody. Thanks, Peter. We're working on that right now. We'll start up again in a couple of seconds here. Can you okay, let me know? Okay, why don't you continue? Thanks. Okay. You have audio. All right. It seems like some people – we may have lost Daryl. And uh, Oh, we. I guess a refresh of the browser seems to have worked if that is a problem for you. All right. Okay. So I'll continue. Um, so, you know, moving towards measurement is, is a necessary but not sufficient to unleash this kind of durable value. Um, it leads me to my second bit of poetry, 
that durable platform-based value in IoT requires us to understand um, data's circulatory – sorry, I'm looking at the chat. It's odd. Okay, understanding um, data's circulatory value. And so I'm making a distinction here between primary and circulatory uses of data. Uh, primary data is gathered and analyzed in order to serve a particular purpose. And that same data, as it is combined, analyzed, and repurposed in alternative contexts, is circulatory data. So let me give some examples of what I mean. Primary data is you using your health tracker to keep tabs on your daily steps. Right? You track, you use your watch to track your yoga progress, to understand your calorie burn rate. This is what I would call primary data. Circulatory data is the use of your data combined with others and then used by healthcare providers to determine best practices, used by insurance providers using that same data to price your health insurance, and government agencies using that same data again in combination with other data modeled and measured um, to understand public health. Farmers want to measure how much water and fertilizer they need to put on their fields. Banks are interested in using that same exact data to price more efficiently the cost of capital. Now, this is of course a slightly psychotic view of how your personal data gets used, traded, mobilized, and then absent regulatory structures and existing mores of privacy, which is kind of where we are at the moment, used against you. Um, but it hopefully illustrates what I want to convey. That is, that the circulatory value, um, what sociologists would say the exchange and use value of your circulatory value of your personal data is almost certainly greater than that data's primary value. It's also a slightly psychotic view in the sense that, um, that almost no data today circulates thoughtfully. right? Rather, the circulation is a stunted, highly impoverished circulation between you and the advertising industry. Much of current day IoT is, is one-off, what I would call every, everyone for themselves um, IoT. So if you look at the left side of this chart, it talks about um, I kind of make a distinction around the integration of a value chain across different kinds of Internet of Things uh, integrations, or actually across any kind of value chain. And along the bottom um, x-axis here is a degree of circulatory data. And most of the IoT solutions that we have are um, one-off solutions that are everything for them, everyone for themselves. So in this case, your lights talk to your alarm clock. Perhaps more suggestively, maybe your car talks to your mechanic. Um, and in a positive light, the primary value of, of the data here is, is potentially high. Right? It's, um, it could be very valuable for you. Um, on the other hand, the circulatory of these data, circulatory value of this data are virtually non-existent. Right? And if this is by design, that's reasonable and often wonderful. Um, however, in our experience doing research around the world um, in these areas, um, it's more often the result not of thoughtfulness and reasonable and wonderful privacy and design, but it's just the lack of future-facing imagination and technological know-how. Um, more frustratingly in our research, we found that no line of sight, that is, where the value, value chain integration could be really high, um, but circulatory uh, value is really low, in those low, no, no line of sight cases, that's the case even in areas where there could be high value in circulating data. So we studied an airport where the parking systems um, were very clever, and they were cleverly decked out with sensors so that when you drove along um, the parking garage, you could actually see um, at a glance uh, through green lights and red lights uh, which spots were available and how many. Um, but that that system, that parking system, it doesn't speak to the concession systems in the airport. It doesn't speak to the air traffic logistics and doesn't speak to the Wi-Fi providers in, uh, in and around that port and the airport. Right? So it's possible that in those areas, um, circulating that data across you know, to know what time of day there's going to be more people, there's going to be more um, commerce, business, airport traffic, et cetera, um, all being used as a signal from the parking garages um, just doesn't travel. Right? 
provocatively, one of my colleagues, Richard Beckwith, uh, has found that uh, he studied water systems in big cities, and the water systems going into cities, generally speaking, don't talk to water systems going out of cities. That is that uh, the systems of water provision um, for, the, for lots of cities um, doesn't talk to the sewer systems and the um, cleaning of water and the sewer systems going out of the city. And again, these are areas where I would say that integration across those value systems could be really, really high. Um, but alas, uh, there's no line of sight. There's no ability to do that. Um, the most vivid example um, from the research that I did on the precision agriculture was um, a fellow who um, understood incredibly well all of the elements that went into his um, dairy cows making milk, right? He knew how much grass was required. He knew how much fertilizer was required for the grass. He knew how much and where to um, caretake the grass. He knew all about how to care for his cows individually at that level um, in order to produce as much milk as he could. Um, and yet, uh, once, that, once that milk left his farm and went from the dairy producer to the dairy processor, he had no idea what happened to it. So he had no idea why some milk got turned into bulk um, dairy milk powder that got sold at commodity prices to China, and other milk got turned into baby formula, which um, you know, pays something like 10,000% higher value. Right? So in those cases, the value chain integration could be incredibly high, but circulatory data, that is data does not travel across different silos. Right? And really to the extent that there are suites of IoT, um, and so where there is circulatory data, uh, you know, smart cities is perhaps the best example of this. Uh, what we get instead of, uh, of synergies, what we get is the hope and the dream of long tail value discovery. And so I've been looking at, uh, at smart cities for quite some time now, and, and it's incredibly frustrating. What you get from smart cities is you get uh, typically, you get a bit of traffic, you get some pollution monitoring, you get social media use, you get monitoring of watering systems, et cetera. Right? You can look this up today if you want to go look at like London's dashboard. There will be a, a dashboard of the city. Um, and at the same time, you know, there's nothing that connects them. So there's a belief somehow that if we identify those trends, we'll be able to find some value there. One company we looked at was trying to track tourists to find out where they go and why in order to, um, what they would say was identify emerging market trends. Right? But what trends? We don't know. How will we find them? The data will tell us. How will the data tell us? Well, we'll just mine the data and then it will tell us. And so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that there's no thoughtful um, traversing, there's no value chain that actually sits across those. They're just a bunch of, um, just a collection of IoT um, data that may travel across those silos but doesn't produce anything for doing so. So we have a joke, a kind of running joke in Portlandia um, around farm to table practices. This comes from the TV show uh, Portlandia, which some of you may have seen. And the joke about it is, you know, it's really, it's, it's completely true to my, my poor little city here, but, you know, it's people who are sitting at a table and, and they're talking about the chicken and the menu and they're saying like, you know, is it local? And they're like, is it, is it, is it USD organic or Oregon organic? And, you know, the server's uh, trying very hard to, you know, be like, oh yeah, yeah it's, it's all the organic. Yeah, yeah, of course. And finally they bring out like a thing that lists like the, the chicken and the chicken's friends and who's the, where the chicken lives and what the chicken's name was in order to, um, you know, to really get that farm-to-table thoughtfulness. And, um, and the joke of it is that it is possible today to measure the environmental impact of a dairy cow in its pasture, um, how much effluence and methane gas it releases. You could trace that animal as it moves through the slaughterhouse, that is how many days it waited, how many people touched the animal, onto a truck, you know, how many miles it drove, at what temperature, and into the market where packaging, measuring bacterial growth in real time would turn color when the meat is no longer fresh, right? So goodbye and frankly good riddance to expiration dates. And that's no joke, right? That is a form of IoT synergy along a highly integrated value chain that provides massive amounts of value along the way, right? 
And the insight here is that you're simply most likely to find circulatory value in IoT data in areas that form natural integrated value chains. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second. Um, Earl, if you want to um, take a few questions, if there are any at this point, or I can go on with the, um, with the rest. Um, I think you're going uh, fine, so why don't you uh, continue and uh, maybe take another check in a few minutes, and then we'll take Q&A at the end. Thanks, awesome. Peter. Sure. So here's the rub, the unsexy toiletry I promised at the outset of the talk. If you want to move toward a world of model to measure, and you want to move toward a world where you can circulate your data with value, it's fundamental to be thoughtful about how that data is captured, identified, and exchanged. Right? And this is what I mean by data provenance. Um, and we have found um, fairly consistently that the two main values, or the two main barriers, excuse me, the two main barriers to data circulation are contentiousness over ownership and contentiousness over value. Who owns the data, who derives value from the data, and who gets punished by the data. Right? This extends to models and to algorithms. So if I withdraw my data, that is if, like in Europe, there's a right to be forgotten. If I withdraw my data from your model, does the data disappear? Maybe. Does your model get refreshed? In other words, that if I withdraw my data from your model, do you rerun your model without my data in it? Or do you get to capture the value of my data even when my data disappears? Right? And the key transition here is from sharing to exchange. A working system must allow people to define boundaries within which the circulation is allowed. There's a big difference between transparency around what sensors are actually measuring, you know, resistance, capacitance, uh, induction, and meaningful data and algorithms, and their attendant metadata. Without a regime of exchange, we're too often left not knowing what we're giving up and what we're getting back from it. In a similar fashion, circulatory data only has value when primary data can successfully travel. That is what sociologists would call uh, commensuration. That is the ability to um, not to make data equal, but to make it comparable via some sort of um, you know, comparison mechanisms. Primary users have high levels of specific knowledge about their fields, their houses, their bodies, their machines, their processes. You wear your Fitbit on days that you exercise. You know your nest runs three degrees too cold because it sits in your drafty hallway. Right? Data sampling is a big problem here. And that's a problem because for additional users to get value from that IoT data, those users need sensors to be placed appropriately. Right? Without strict compliance, additional users need metadata about the placements. So something like this sensor is in the wettest part of my field, or this sensor is where the sun shines the most, or this Fitbit is being worn on a day where I'm exercising but not on days when I'm not exercising. Without metadata or strict protocol compliance, the data are only useful to the primary user. And so just let me run over this just again to see if I can um, clarify. On the left side of here, we have stewardship. And stewardship is really about exchange and what you're getting for your data, what you're getting back from your data, and how you're getting or not getting punished by your data. Right? These are issues which too often have been um, simplified, and I think um, the discussion and the ability to have meaningful dialogue about what the value of data is gets limited by our notions of what I would say is just like privacy. So what we're looking for is something like really real stewardship of data, and really an ability to exchange the data in ways that are reasonable and amenable to both the people who are getting value from it um, on the business side and people who are getting value from it by either giving up or transferring or exchanging their data for value on the consumer side. And the protocol issue is incredibly um, difficult to solve, but also incredibly important. Um, what we have found is that um, People who are using IoT data in the natural environment for their own purposes, for the most part, don't have a sense in which uh, what they're doing is going to have value outside of their own framework for it. 
So a lot of times uh, in the farming example, I would say is, you know, we had a we had these um, this farmer who wanted to put all the sensors in the wettest part of his field, and the reason he wanted to put them in the wettest part of his field was because, you know, for him, uh, that was the most problematic part of his field. That totally makes sense. But if the next farmer over um, is trying to learn, you know, something about the relationship between you know, pesticide use or pest infestation and temperature or how many, you know, days of sun the grapes need in order to grow based on the sensors that are in his field and in surrounding fields. All that he's going to get is he's going to get, um, he's going to get, uh, you know, data back from the next farmer over's wettest part of their field, and it's not going to actually tell them anything meaningful. So if I um, create protocols or if I, you know, imagine that uh, our, our, the number that we took as, you know, normal temperature, that is 98.6, that if people only took people's temperature when they were, um, when people ran a fever, then we wouldn't know what, what normal is. And so protocols allow us to create baselines and commensurability across, um, across different kinds of implementations. And that allows the data to travel. Um, so with good commensurability, that is good sampling or great metadata, something actually interesting and, and I would argue slightly magical happens. Uh, sampling and circulation begins to challenge our ideas of community, who makes it up, and how much proximity matters. Just as usage-based insurance reveals that I may drive just like a 20-year-old woman from Austin and just like a 78-year-old man in Bethesda, so too it changes who my physical community is. And so it may be that, um, and this actually happened, that uh, we ran into a guy who um, was, uh, had sensors in his field and in a greenhouse. And in the greenhouse, he was growing flowers. And in his fields, he was growing actually poppies, opium poppies. Turns out Australia is one of the, Tasmania is one of the few places you're allowed to grow pharmaceutical uh, opium, um, which is something I didn't know before I went there. Um, anyway, um, for his outside field, the, um, it wasn't actually the farm next door, but it was the farm over the hill that actually was his, his neighbor, really, because that was the person who had a farm whose characteristics most closely matched his. And so understanding who that neighbor was, it wasn't a physical neighbor, but understanding who that neighbor was over the hill and what they were doing on their farm was much more important than understanding um, who their individual like proximity neighbor was. And so what you get is it's not a replacement of who's my neighbor. You get an overlapping of a kind of data shed neighbor, right? You don't share a watershed. You don't share an air shed. You share a data shed. Um, on the other hand, the field that he had inside of his greenhouse um, was much more like a woman who lived in Amsterdam. And so his neighbor, right, in that instance on the same exact um, part of the in, – in the same exact um, field, really, in a greenhouse, um, his neighbor in that case was a woman who was halfway across the world in Amsterdam, who also had a greenhouse that resembled his characteristics and grew the same kind of crop. Right. So I'm going to end. If I had more time, I would, um, I would tell you more. I want to open it up to some questions. Um, I would wax poetic about the massive increases in connectivity that are coming around the corner. Uh, the decentralized machine-to-machine -machine transactions that are, I think, on the cusp of being enabled. And um, if we were going to go into more about the, the, the plumbing, we could really talk more about the compute topography that's required to efficiently allocate data at the edges of IoT networks, um, specifically if you want to do you know, high data transfer out in the natural environment. Currently, uh, the network is too slow to do that. So there are some really interesting open questions about how much data you simplify and calculate at the edge of the network, how much data you um, keep and capture uh, at, the, at the point of, of sensor, and how much of that you send back to the cloud or to the data center. Um, and so I would look at those things alongside the business models that are um, required to develop in order to make those changes feasible. But in the meantime, I would say, um, Consider migrating to measurement uh, along circulating data chains. Uh, practice good data stewardship along rigorous data collection protocols. And those are where I think the opportunities are if you're willing to embrace them.
Great. Okay. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, we did have some questions that came in uh, while you were speaking. I want to get to those and then maybe give you a little time at the end to elaborate on one of those topics that you mentioned just now, uh, share more of your, your experience there. Um, sure. Susan had a question I think relates to your last comment just now, and that is um, to what extent are you confident or are you seeing examples of companies that are really developing the, the stewardship uh, exchange that you described and, and the protocols uh, that will really benefit all parties. I think implicit in, in a lot of what you're talking about in the notion of exchange is you give to get. Uh, so right. consumers are allowing information, uh, mo you know, you know, mobile location, that sort of thing to be gathered about them uh, if it can personalize an offer or help in some way, uh, as you illustrated with the example of the farmer and others. Um, there's a real value exchange there. But just uh, what are some examples of companies that maybe are doing that? Uh, and maybe what are some of the potential barriers or pitfalls to actually implementing uh, those stewardship practices and protocols that you described? Right. So I would say that um, the place we've seen this most is at the, um, interestingly, at the community development level. And so uh, smart cities, and uh, it tends to be public organizations, um, but not always. There's a public-private partnership um, that was building around agricultural IoT in order to create um, new forms of uh, technological of like development communities. So it was a new way of saying, like, can we uh, replace extractive industries with technological farming and things like that? Um, and in those cases, the reason why it was really successful was because uh, those companies were interested or had a kind of interest of a collective in mind. Um, and cities the same way. Cities have, like public institutions are much more accountable as I think the tone of the question is basically, um, I think if I, if I gather the tone, it's, um, it's that we, sh we should have low confidence that, that uh, individual companies will actually create stewardship. Um, and I think that's, that's probably fair. I think the problem right now is that um, it's something of a land grab, and um, most companies, um, my own uh, company, I would say, sort of included. Uh, we, until you know, very recently, I feel like we did a really good job of um, of making sure our CEO would not make statements about you know Intel's desire to capture and collect uh, personal data. Um, but you know, and so maybe most recently, I think he has said things that you hear all the time from other companies, like you know, data is the new oil, et cetera. And I think that. Um, we're in this intermediate period where there is something of a land grab, and so people, I think, don't see uh, they 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 see the the value of the exchange that they're getting only in terms of I give up my personal data and I get back you know Google Maps, or I give up my personal data and I get back uh, from 23andMe, which is a company that does um, DNA identification. Um, I get back from 23andMe, uh, you know, a kind of cool assessment of uh, of the risk profiles of my personal DNA. Um, I think what we're what we're going to get is at some point. I mean, we should know, and we should what will what I suspect will happen is that we will become more aware of the fact that 23andMe sells most of its data to pharmaceutical companies, who then take that same personal data, um, collect it, collate it. Um, and then use it as a way to uh, do drug discovery. And so what's missing is uh, both the, I think at the moment it's a, tech, it's a socio-technical problem. What's missing is the regulatory infrastructure around what happens to your personal data, but also the technological infrastructure to trace back, you know, how much of that um, personal DNA, you know, marker data came from me individually, and what percentage? Maybe it's 0.0003% of that um, pharmaceutical discovery is attributable to my, to the inclusion of my DNA in that in that uh, model. And maybe I should get 0.0003% of the profits from whatever drugs that come out of it. Um, and right now, I would say that we don't have the um, technological capacity to uh, trace back where that data came from um, in a way that, that preserves individual privacy but also um, allows for that circulation. And I think that those are the kind of questions and problems that need to get worked out. Um, I think that left to their own devices, uh, I, I would say that um, for the most part, it, you're right, it's mostly a, a poor, uh, stunted relationship really between you a single for-profit company and a bunch of advertisers. Um, 
you know, I think you make a, an interesting point about the, the, the circulatory value of the data. Of what you're describing is the situation where we don't truly have an exchange. As you said, we don't really have the technology platform yet like, uh, you know, the, the stock market trading floors to, to get that exchange going, but maybe that's where we are and need to be going uh, so that there is truly more value on both ends of that exchange. Uh, like I say, it's not just a one-way or a one-off. And I think it's also related to a, an important point you made about the, the sort of um, spotty nature of how these things evolve. But we're, uh, we're having very one-off discrete applications of IoT technology, uh, the self-stocking refrigerator that you alluded to, uh, and we don't see the big picture. Uh, everyone knows only what they know about the value of data and their little circumscribed use or silo, and we're not connecting these in value chains, and I think that's an important insight. Um, I want to build on that uh, in a different way, though, and, and that is, uh, for, uh, I suspect a lot of people in the audience are, are themselves people in market research or insights for their organizations. And um, your comment about the provenance of the data or the, having the protocols for where the sensors go and how they're compared and, and uh, aggregated and so forth, uh, is, it seems to me it's the classic case of sampling bi uh, bias or sampling error. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah, and and so it, it's funny. We could be led astray, I suspect. We look at all these new sources of big data and, and analytics and algorithms and machine learning and all this good stuff, but it's only as good as the data going in, and if we don't know where that data comes from or how representative it is, uh, we're easily led astray. So I wonder if you want to elaborate on that a bit. Sure. I mean, we're a technology company, and uh, the answers that I'm going to give you are going to be ones that uh, fancy engineers who like technology are going to give you. Um, some of the things around um, provenance and ca the carrying capacity of uh, you know, where that individualized data goes, we've talked about in terms of um, something that we would call um, – it's called distributed ledgers, and it's kind of uh, there's been a lot of discussion around things like Bitcoin and other kinds of cryptocurrencies. And the underlying protocols of cryptocurrencies is a distributed database mechanism. And if you marry that to a kind of IoT infrastructure, um, some people uh, here at Intel and at, at IBM, they've been trying to do this um, for a while, as well is um, is to be able to create. Um, a full-on distributed record of you know, how data gets um, managed and then to do some kind of micropayments through those networks, which um, you know, I would say is something to look for, although right now um, it's super high on the hype cycle and it's not clear that, that this is a solution that's going to be viable to trace the data all the way through. And then this other solution about um, data uh, protocols is, uh, again, either I think that that machine learning and um, some other kinds of technologies provide a, a key here. I I would say that if you're going to, um, if you're go I, I, it's something as simple as being able to um, to hit a, a button on your Nest and and just verbally say you know this this Nest is in the uh, drafty hallway um, might actually go a long way towards understanding you know where this is and and where that where that particular sensor is in the house. Um, or to uh, so if you could I mean some some version of even like a, a mechanism just any mechanism to do verbal um, discussion of where the sensor is being placed uh, more complicated uh, the things that I've seen have been companies and business models that evolve around not just selling the um, not just selling the sensors but to actually do IoT as a service and so um, so some people will do a thing where well they will go out and put the sensors in your field. Um, and so what you get from something like that is um, the ownership of the sensors and the, and the value and the requirements, the technological know-how um, doesn't have to belong to the, to the farmer or to the user. In those cases, it could be simply, you know, not simply, but it would be a service and you would pay for an app or some kind of um, value that you would get from using that service. And so in that case, um, you, you lose some of the requirement around IoT um, protocols because there's somebody else who's implementing them. So one, so one thing I think that we'll start to see is, again, we'll start to see um, services and business models or practices around those, um, those transformations. And then some fancy like, people. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I say, it sounds like the classic example of the market makers, the entrepreneur that, that finds that uh, arbitrage, if you will. There's data, there are data needs, and maybe that third-party supplier is the way we evolve some of those standards. Uh, I right. want to remind the audience that you can uh, post questions to Peter uh, with the chat function, so uh, feel free to continue to do that. 
Um, I also wanted to come back to another point you made, and I, it really struck me uh, at your presentation last September at George Washington University, and there was some good discussion around that, and that is the notion of insurance kind of leading the way. It's, it's the, uh, I think it, the term you used was natural model or, or a way to think about how ILT will impact consumer behavior. Uh, and to me, it's a, a classic example of technology adoption. We, we often put the new wine in old bottles, you know, the classic example. <laughs> of when we first had movies, they were just film versions of staged uh, dramas. You know, the, the notion of cross-cutting and montage and so forth didn't develop until later when we realized the new medium lent itself to a very different uh, aesthetic. And by analogy, you know, it seems like some of the earliest uses are just, like you say, the self-stocking refrigerator or whatever, and we haven't really built the use cases, but it seems like that notion of moving from models to measurement is the real key here, that it's a really different world if we have that continuous feedback of actual individual level behavior as opposed to uh, generalizations and models. And maybe just elaborate a bit more about how that's going to change the whole uh, realm of, of market research insights, the kind of thing that, again, I suspect a lot of our audience uh, yeah. does for a living. So um, our example was uh, around um, insurance. What we were finding is that it, it, insurance is like undergoing is, and it's going to be a slow transformation, but it's going to be like a once in a hundred year transformation of insurance. Um, they're, they have a longstanding science associated with them um, around actuarial um, tables and probabilities. And I think that, that what's changing is, uh, is this ability to do real time measurement. Um, so, for instance, you can do um, any any kind of risk assessment. Um, we we spoke to somebody who was trying to put sensors into a um, and and actually even use the ones that were already there in a Walmart to understand how many people were in a store at any given time, and to price uh, slip and fall insurance uh, for that for that store based not just on a six month um, cycle, but on how many people were in the store at any given time or workers' comp based on how many workers happen to be in your office on any given day. Um, and so this is um, both fascinating, but also I want to say potentially frightening for people because um, on some level, the shift from you know, getting uh, car insurance based on you know, your demographics to uh, getting car insurance based on how and where you drive um, doesn't make inequality disappear or go away. Um, it, it changes the nature of that inequality. So it's possible that um, that, that, shift is going, that shift of a statistic of one means that for some people who you know, live in um, poorer areas or something like that where their behaviors are going to be automatically um, more risky, um, it's possible that insurance is going to have to accommodate that. Um, on the other hand, I, I think that what's, what we were finding around the change in the business model is that insurance is uh, leading the way because understanding risk for them is existential to that industry. And so uh, being able to get in front of this um, means that insurance has been really proactive about trying to get IoT in the ground. And so uh, what I think we were saying was uh, during that conference is that um, IoT is the uh, – insurance is the is a kind of natural business model for IoT on some level in the same way that uh, advertising is the natural – uh, business model around uh, the inter around the current the current you know web, um, and so already we've seen you know that um, Progressive will pay for the kit to get into your car, um, and uh, there are some deals that are already around. Uh, you know, if you buy a Nest, then the insurance company, some insurance companies will actually pay for you to have a Nest, as long as you are able and willing to have that Nest report back to the insurance company that um, it's on and operational. It turns out that many of the fires uh, that happen in people's homes can be avoided simply by, you know, because the, you know, the smoke, the smoke detector is not on. And so um, the nest, it's not the Nest, it's the Nest, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's the Nest smoke alarm. Um, and so they are able to and willing to pay for you to have that kit in the ground in, order, in exchange for having that data get reported back to them. But you can imagine this happening um, initially as a kind of carrot um, which is what's happening right now is that we'll give you uh, if you're there's a company in the UK that gives teenagers cheaper car insurance in exchange for putting a telematics device in their car because um, that way they can actually give insurance to you know teenagers who are quote good drivers. Um, but eventually this is going to be carrot and stick is my is my assumption. And so in insurance, if you 
um, are able to change your risk pool and to effectively cherry pick the risk pool of drivers or homeowners, et cetera, then you actually, it becomes good business practice and it kind of screws your um, competitors because it leaves them with not just um, lagging in terms of technology, but also leaves them with a worse risk pool in terms of their customer base. And so there are lots of incentives for the insurance industry to kind of um, get behind this and to be a kind of uh, rabbit in this, in this area. Yeah, that, that's interesting because not only is it a business model for the companies to adapt, and as you say, actuarials or, or maybe their businesses or their jobs are a little bit threatened these days, yeah. but it's also a model for consumers to understand why this is happening the way it is, the notion of assessing risk on a more discreet basis based right. on driving behavior as opposed to just age or location or something. Um, and it sounds like part of what's happening in the insurance industry, maybe we can anticipate in other uh fields is that we're moving away from the, the modeling, as you put it, the, the assessment of the risk to the management of the risk right. factors, uh, loss prevention. So if I'm a home insurance company, instead of just giving you a policy based on your likelihood of having an accident or something, I'm actually now with IoT, as it were, able to monitor your home and warn you about risk factors that you, we both win when you avoid that. You don't want to recover from a fall. You want to avoid a fall. Right. And I would actually say that I think that, that, that the shift from model to measure is going to be uh, – I'm not much of a futurist, but it's starting to look like it's going to be just as transformational a shift as the kind of shift to mobile and real-time um, data for maps and things like that. Like nobody, nobody expects to get a, a – Tom, there used to be Thomas Guides and maps and AAA. You'd, you'd get a, a map before you left the house or before you left for a trip like two weeks before. Nobody thinks about it. it has, Google Maps and Waze and all of the mapping things have really changed people's relationships with real-time information. And I think that we're going to see similar kinds of things with model to measure, that it's, it's not going to be enough for a company to say we have a green supply chain, here's a couple of pictures of some, some birds in a, in, a, in a grassland somewhere, that we're going to have to, that I, I believe that this allows people to actually verify it in real time. That's not to say that there won't be cheating and fraud and et cetera around the measures, um, just as you know, every measure that we'll create will be, we will equally create people who will game those measures. But I think that the that the ability to verify those things in real time, um, and the desire for people to actually see that as a confirmation of what's happening. How local is my chicken? Well, I want to be able to like track it, you know. And personally, I don't really want to track the cow that I'm about to eat because it feels really weird and kind of unethically, you know, I shouldn't eat the cow. But um, but I could certainly see that, that happening um, and crossing over to areas where that doesn't seem like it's going to happen today. Like, how do I know that this is a good college? Why is this college guide and reputation being the thing that I'm measuring? Um, in Portland, um, you know, you already start to see just hints of this kind of stuff in broadly in, in the area. I think um, I was most surprised by the beer culture in Portland. Um, Boy, Portlanders love their beer. But beer has like an ABV and a specific gravity weight. And like now, if you look at any menu, you'll see like seven measures around the actual beer. Not wow. just, you know, like it's hoppy or whatever, but, like, you know, what are the measures? And I think that that's coming. And I think that that is only going to grow. Well, and, and one last question, and maybe a little bit more speculative. And again, I, I sort of turn it back on behalf of the audience. Uh, uh, what, in a world of measurement as opposed to models, um, what is the role of the market research data analyst or whatever? You, I mean, in theory, you could and probably should build these sensors and feedback loops into just about every aspect of service delivery and interaction with customers and so forth. So a lot of it becomes or could at least potentially be automated. You don't have to build a predictive model, run it, and then advise managers about what to do. It's sort of baked into the system. Um, in that sort of dystopian or utopian future, what is the role of the, right. the insights analyst, uh, the kind of role you've been playing in Intel uh, recently? Uh -huh. so. um, am I putting myself out of work via machines? Maybe. <laughs> um, I think that road is going to be quite bumpy. I think what we've when finding, for instance, is um, lots of instances where people, um, you know, have sensors in the ground and then pull them um, because they know that the data are powerful. Um, so we we ran across these people who were built, who who would put sensors in bridges um, as they were doing construction, so that you could tell, like, if uh, you know, if if the construction was shaking the bridge too much, and um, they would embed these things in concrete and you know sink them into the ground. 
And then after they were done with the construction, they would actually clip the wire so that you couldn't read the sensors anymore. And the reason they would do that is because for them, uh, you know, the only thing that could happen with that data is to be a source of liability for them. Um, similar to that, there was a company that did logistics, and they were they had a trucking company, and they would put um, they would they would not put they would put GPS in their trucks, but they would not put um, temperature controls or uh, a thing that would tell you if the thing tipped over inside the truck. And the reason was because if a truck is traveling from Chicago to Los Angeles and it tips over, there's or or it uh, it, it the temperature goes goes haywire. The only thing that they could learn from that is that um, they can't fix it; they could only become liable for it. And so, on some level, like we will, we, it will be a, it will not be a linear road towards the implementation of of measures everywhere. So I guess I'm not, I'm not really worried about that. I do think that there will be pressure to have a, have those measures everywhere. And then the questions will be, why aren't there measures? Why aren't you measuring it? Why aren't you reading it? Um, and in those instances, um, you know, I do think that, you know, I, maybe I'm hopeful that one day there'll be, you know, some way to do like the long tail of of value discovery, but and that might put me out of a job. Um, <laughs> well, let's hope but in I the think. meantime, like it's so much low hanging fruit. Like don't don't start where there's you know don't start where there's trying to measure the difference between like how many flowers are in season and how many cows are in the field and how many people are staying in a hotel. Like you know p go to the value chain. Like people in hotels want restaurants that have agricultural producers that give them food. They want tourism, they, you know what I mean? Like they, the things are, are already obvious where some of those value chains are. And I think that the first low-hanging fruit is going to be around picking off the value chains we already know exist. I think that's a great note to end on because it does suggest that there's still a role uh, for us humans uh, for the next few <laughs> years anyway. Yeah, I suspect, so I, yeah. I really want to thank Peter again. If, if we didn't get to questions you might have had for Peter, you can reach him at peter.levin at intel.com. I'm sure he'd be happy to continue the dialogue. Uh, and again, I want to thank Peter for a great presentation. Uh, our next webinar will be held Wednesday, March 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and will feature Donna Hoffman and Tom Novak from George Washington University's Center for Technology and Consumer. And these were the individuals that uh, worked with us and Peter to host this meeting that uh, we alluded to. Uh, you'll learn from them, I think, a very complimentary presentation to Peter's on how to begin thinking about building use cases for consumer adoption of the Internet of Things and how it's going to change consumer behavior. So I encourage you to uh, sign up uh, for that webinar as well. And again, thanks to Peter for a great presentation. My pleasure. Thank you.